Uh, so hi everybody. I'm not going to try and say good morning or good evening. Uh, it's quite late for me here. Um, so today I'm going to present to you some of the results um, from a study that we've been, we did a couple of years ago now that I'm desperately trying to get out, uh, hopefully in a paper soon, which is looking at uh, two coexisting sulfide textures that we see at Norilsk uh, in the different ore bodies, uh, blebi sulfides and interst interstitial sulfides. Um, um, and so the aim of this study was to try and gain a better understanding of genetic processes uh, at Norilsk um, through the use of two different tools in particular, uh, in-situ laser ablation ICPMS and in-situ sulfur analysis on the same sulfides. Um, so, oh sorry, okay, I just realized we we're on the present on, on the other slide. So yeah, this is what I just uh, said earlier. So here is just an example. I'm just going to put the pointer. Okay, it doesn't allow me, so it's going to stay like that. Um, so these are the blebi sulfides I'm talking about, and these are the coexisting interstitial um, sulfides. So those are the two textures that we're going to look at. So this is a, so all of you are quite well, uh, know quite well the accepted model for the genetic of magmatic nickel sulfide deposits. Uh, this diagram just briefly grows through the most important processes that are at play. And the two processes in particular that we are sitting in this study are the process of crustal assimilation uh, and sulfur contamination of, well, crustal contamination and sulfur assimilation uh, of the melt. Um, and we are studying this by looking at the sulfur's recomposition of the sulfides mainly. Um, and then the other process is, is the interaction of uh, the sulfide melt with the silicate melt. And uh, these, we are, these we are doing by looking at both the sulfides recomposition again, but also the actual uh, metal and PG enrichment of the sulfides. So the in-situ laser ablation data. So I'm not going to go into any details about the geology of Norilsk since there's been so many diff presentations before me doing that. So save me some time. Um, but this is just a simple cross section, uh, very simplified through the section where you can see that here the Kerala intrusion uh, and here um, uh, the Telma intrusion. And so you can see that um, the samples that we took are from uh, Kerala, Telma, and Norilsk one intrusions. And they're from uh, the picritic and taxitic gabbro-dolerite uh, and from the disseminated sulfides within those uh, units. Um, so here are photos of the samples that we looked at. Um, so these are polished re reflected light images. Um, and here is just a 3D uh, CT scan of one of the sample where we can really clearly see those blebi sulfides I was talking about. And in gray here, you have the interstitial sulfides. Uh, so we had about, th we had three samples from Karolak that we looked at, three from the real one and one from the Talak intrusion. So if we go dive into the results, so these are the results of the software as a study. So this is uh, Delta 34 on the X axis against cap Delta 33 on the Y axis. And um, what the results show is that there is a generally heavy sulfur azotropic signature that goes from one to 17 per mil um, 34 sulfur, which is what we expected. And there's a big spread in between different intrusions, but even within the same intrusion, carry like here, for example, you can have a big spread that goes from seven to 17 uh, parts per mil. And so this is inferred as uh, people referred to earlier in this uh, conference to sulfur assimilation from the anhydrite rich sediment layers uh, by the silicate melt. Um, and um, so if we now compare our two different populations, so this is a box and whisker plot um, of 34 sulfur. And in purple, you've got the blebi uh, sulfides and in orangey yellow, the network disseminated sulfides. And what we can see is that both sulfide population within each sample seem to have undergone the same history in terms of sulfur assimilation from the anhydrite rich rock, as well as a re homogenization of the sulfur azotropic signature by interacting with the silicate melt, because we don't see a clear difference between the two different populations within these different intrusions. Um, 
And so this is here, Carillac, just to zoom in here, where we had three different samples. And you can see that even though you, it looks like there might be differences in between disseminated and Blebi here um, within a Carillac data set, this difference actually is just due to the fact that there's actually differences between samples, but not between the two different populations. So that's one thing. Now um, we also want to look at the uh, metal enrichment of our sulfides. Um, and so this is a plot from a recent paper by Steve Barnes, which is now in press, I think. Um, and that's uh, a paper that was looking at loop textures um, at pentadites. And um, this is plotting palladium tenors uh, in 100% sulfides and palladium PBM in pentadite. And you can see this really nice correlation here between the two. Uh, which is why we basically decided to use pelagium in pentandite as a proxy uh, for the original PG enrichment of the sulfide liquid before crystallization. So now I'm going to show you data which is pelagium in pentandite for the same sulfides as the one I showed you uh, sulfur sulfur isotopic data for. So here are the results. So these are the three samples from the risk one, sample from Talnac and the samples from Karelak. And what we can see here is that there doesn't seem to be a real difference uh, between Blebi and disseminated sulfides here again uh, for the two different sulfide population, Blebi and disseminated. So the palladium and pentadite varies between one sample to the next and varies between intrusions, but doesn't seem to vary uh, within one sample. Now, after studying in more detail the 3D scans, um, we actually realized um, that a lot of what we call interstitial uh, sulfides were actually interconnected together and also inter interconnected with the large plebs. And so we, so we interpret this interconnectivity as being the result of sulfide infiltration from the very large plebs into the silicate crystal framework, and that's creating this interconnectivity with the sulfide. So even if the sulfides were isolated to begin with, um, we now have a large degree of interconnectivity. And this raises the question to, um, there's two different hypotheses now in terms of interpretation of the results that we just showed. Did we have two types of sulfide textures that had the same um, sulfur as decomposition and the same metal tenors before the sulfide infiltration? Or is it the diffusion um, after sulfide infiltration within that interconnected framework that re homogeneized the composition um, of our sulfides? Um, and to test that, we decided to take two more samples uh, from our, within our sample set, really targeting um, the fully isolated sulfide blebs that we could see within um, the 3D CT scans. And so the two um, scenarios that we're testing here is scenario one here, where you have the same sulfur isotopic and metal composition of the two textures before sulfide infiltration. So you have the same um, 34 sulfur, the same palladium content of the, of the sulfides before the infiltration. And so you would expect to see the same even after infiltration. Scenario two, you have an actual a different sulfur isotope and palladium uh, composition of your large blebs compared to small isolated blebs, for example. And then after infiltration, if you have a rehomogenization by diffusion within the sulfides, um, then the sulfides that are within the blebs and within the interconnected, interconnected framework would still would show the same sulfur that to the composition and palladium content but the few plebs that are still isolated from that interconnected network would actually show different sulfur isotopic and palladium content of your sulfides. So if we go back to the data now. Um, so here you've got to add a color here to the plot, which is uh, for the completely isolated um, sulfides. And so that's for the two different samples. Unfortunately, this one didn't have bleb uh, only the completely isolated sulfide. So if you look at this sample here, which is from the Karelak intrusion. Well, there does seem to maybe be a difference now between our Blebi and interconnected here, so those two populations, and our fully isolated sulfides with an increase in the palladium in pentandite um, for the completely isolated sulfides. 
Now, if we look at the sulfides looping composition, it's not quite as clear, but there also seem to be a variation between those two different populations or three different populations with a decrease um, in the sulfur 34 azotopic composition um, with a lighter, a slightly lighter composition for the completely isolated sulfides. So it's not extremely obvious and this would need a lot more work and more data to be collected, but maybe there are two different populations to begin with. Um, the interstitial isolated sulfides and the large plebs with the interstitial sulfide showing slightly more elevated PG contents and slightly lighter sulfurs of the compositions. So maybe as a very small bleb, the interstitial sulfides might have managed to interact more efficiently with the silicate melt and get more enriched in chagopai elements than the larger blebs um, that proportionally have less contact surface with the melt. So that's um, a potential interpretation for this observation. Now, um, I'm just going to quickly uh, go through something here, which is what we call the uh, sulfur azotopic paradox um, and Hrilsk, um, which is looking at the relationship between so the sulfur 34 values and the PG composition of our sulfides. So if we look at different models, what we would expect is that with increasing R factor, so increasing interaction between your silicate melt and your sulfide melt, you would tend to have a decrease in your sulfur isotopic composition of your sulfides going towards mental, but an increase in your uh, palladium content of your bentonite. Um, and so you would expect this type of relationship between palladium and bentonite and 30, so th sulfur 34 values with increasing R factor going that way. Well, when we use our data where we have in situ um, sulfur 34 and palladium and pentanide for the same sulfide, we actually don't see that trend at all. Um, and that to me is a big question as to why. Um, and I'm not going to try and answer this question today, uh, but we do have um, a few hypotheses uh, flying around. And I think the next talk uh, might um, talk about some of those uh, by Jala Yakono, uh, but maybe the presence of the volatile phase within the neural scores, which is here represented by these silica caps that we've talked about before, um, maybe that has um, a big importance in some of the genetic processes that are at play, and maybe that uh, plays a role in this sulfur as paradox, as I call it, um, at Norilsk. And another thing that we uh, are trying to investigate a bit more now is maybe there is a difference in the efficiency of isotopic diffusion of sulfur compared to the diffusion of chalcopite elements into sulfides. Uh, and that might explain why um, we don't have that relationship that we would expect. Um, so I'm not sure about the amount of time that I've spent talking. Um, so I might leave time for questions and for our next presenter. I know we're not in really early on time there, so I might finish on this. And I just want to thank all of the co-workers um, who worked with me on this. Uh, Steve Barnes, Laura Martin, Louis Schoenveld, Noreen Evans from Caroline, Belinda Godel, and Mike Barrell. Thank you.